This is an Avocado Media Network presentation. Chapter 5 Sins of the Father In 2006, my father and I were on a journey of reconciliation. I use the word journey because in all honesty, it didn't last that long, but also to alert you to the fact that we hadn't yet reached our destination. In fact, we never reached our destination. After surviving three successive strokes, my father finally stopped being a soldier and gave in to what I can only assume is the warm embrace of eternal sleep. The last time I saw him alive was in his hospital ward, emaciated but still a stubborn man that chose that as the perfect time to tell me not to lose my cool if he lost consciousness, because that was not the Muligisa way. Even in death, he was one of the most unconventional people I had ever known. That was dad. My earliest memories of my father were of his beard. When I was a little boy, he would scoop me up and give me these really gross smooches on my cheek, and his bush of a beard would assault my face with the tickles. Because of my ticklish nature, I would squirm in protest, but he would hold me firmly in place in a very uncomfortable and yet delightful father and son moment. Looking back now, I realized that that was the truest definition of my father. He was a hard man with a soft side. When I started rapping, I was immediately confronted with the need to have a cool origin story. All my favorite artists had one. I was still in that experimental phase where American pop culture meant more to me than stories of my own flesh and blood. In my eyes, I wasn't cool until I had a story as revolutionary as Tupac's or as downright dirty as Eminem's. I wanted people to look at me and because of my deep origin story, find an explanation for whatever behavior I was trying to explain at the moment. But my story, for the time being, was as bland as they came. It was with this type of mindset that future me would come to realize that the irony of the journey to discover my origins would be what would make the better story. If I had looked close enough, I would have seen the story of the son of a revolutionary that was trying to fight his oppressors with books and grimes. I guess that's a story for someone else to write. Let's get back to my father. For starters, he was short in stature. I have always found short people interesting. They are usually, to the best of my knowledge, compensating for the height deficit one way or another. It's quite hilarious to watch. On top of his height issues, he had friend issues. My father, while he was alive, befriended some of the most powerful people that the country has ever seen. I remember pouring water for the chief of police as he sat in our red, moth-eaten couches. I remember always wondering why he would go to extreme lengths to impress and host people that couldn't care enough about him to fill the smallest cup Thumbelina could find. Somewhere along this path, I unearthed a major character trait in me that I didn't like. I didn't like my tendency to sponge off people's personalities and attributes. Sometimes it worked out fine, and I learned a new word. On other occasions though, I would end up in a shabby house doing illegal things. Those were my extremes either learn or burn. Throughout my life, I have latched onto so many people's ideas and personalities that I'm not truly sure who I am anymore. I cannot remember a time when I wasn't latching onto something in one form or another. As a child, I always felt like I was different from the other kids. I always felt like I was looking at the world through a lens that only I was privy to. It was probably just my puberty kicking in. If it wasn't, however, I like the results that presents. 
Those results would give me answers for the questions which otherwise would point towards sheer madness. This sheer madness must have been what I had in common with my late father. We were both eccentric in the way that we chose to rebel. I look at pictures of my father and I swear to you, the twinkle on his eye is just like mine. This helped me deal with the fact that he was a bad husband to his wife. That was my dad. He taught me everything I know. Even this. This need I have to somehow be at the center of the universe. I have always worried about it because it has made me do some truly amazing things. I could very well be out of my mind and you wouldn't know because you're a fan of my particular genre of lunacy. Human beings truly cannot exist alone. They would shrivel up and die. They would die from the mere human contact they spend so much time pretending not to need. What is life? I don't know. All I know is that I am here on account of a short handsome man that may or may not have ruined me for the world. It has been interesting to watch which parts of him I have chosen to emulate. The one part I will never get right will always be his pain. I have not been through anything to compare to what my father lived through. He once told me a story where he and a fellow liberation soldier were ambushed while they were in the back of a van. According to him, my father's friend had pulled out a grenade to try and throw it at the enemy and held it too long. The explosion had thrown everything apart and in shock, his friend had run a small distance armless. They found him in the fetal position. Dead. Those were my bedtime stories. I joke. His pain I shall never be able to claim. I would like you to take a moment to think about the number of timelines I am taking you through, inclusive of this one, where I could be anywhere while typing this. Did you notice how your mind started looking for a background to place me in? What is this need to put things in order that your mind aspires to? Have you seen how far I have taken your thoughts? Isn't the human mind a wonderful machine? If ever you need reason to keep living, then that should be it. The beauty of life is in the journey through it. Let's get back to bed. On my blog site, I had once written an amateur piece on my relationship between my father and I. The article, to me, is amateur because I had written it from only one side. I understand why my father could not allow me to pursue the arts. I get it. I get that he had grown up in a time when all one could rely on was a commercial trade. After the last world war, I say it like that because I truly hope it is. The world was not very kind to artists. After such a rich upbringing, the world started to frown at the arts because they seemed like such a childish thing to chase during serious time. Because of this, an entire school of respect for the arts was closed while the dependency on an education system for validation went up in the ranks. It was a perfect switcheroo. I also understand how he threw grenades at tanks for me to have the future that I may be abusing with all these vain machinations. I understand all that. I just need him to understand that I am also doing my part to change the world. He gave me the blueprint, and true to the apple and tree analogy, I have not fallen very far away from the tree. I may actually be closer to the tree than I think, but that is only a possibility because of certain parts of his life I cannot account for. I could find out from them, but I believe some things are better left unturned. All of this is only part of the reason I thought he would have been more understanding when I told him I wanted to make music. The concept of entertainment was not alien to him. He had told me stories about how he wanted our family to be a singing group, like Makoma. That was an idea from him, not me. At the time he told me about it, he didn't even know that I was interested in music. Why would that mind choose to stifle the attempts of a child just trying to experiment? Isn't that how children work? I shudder to think of all the time I would have dedicated to being someone else if he had left me to get bored with music. The signs were there. He knew I had an attention deficit. The teachers always complained about it to him and he would glare at me in such disapproval. I started to enjoy that level of disapproval, by the way. From the first grade to the fourth grade, I aced every year at the top of the class. I got all the trophies. My father must have been misled by this. I had been doing well because I was having fun learning how to count and make sense of numbers. That soon became boring because I learned of other places to get education. I had learned that people were such a hub of knowledge. I was watching Michael Jackson videos and my father didn't see a problem with it. 
He couldn't tell how he had led a curious mind into a candy store. He was showing me the king of pop. He was showing me the messiah of live performances. He was showing me a misunderstood child like me and I saw that I could make it through art. I couldn't dance though. So I chose to draw comics. My ability to draw was not as good as my ability to tell stories. And I was often frustrated at not being able to bring an idea to a page fully. I struggled until I met a guy named Gavin. He taught me how to draw with ink, believe it or not. And I got a new style I could use. These drawings of mine became popular in my neighborhood. At a certain point, I started to sell them. That was my first real hustle. I was selling pen drawings to schoolgirls. Gavin was also into music, and he began to share his selection with me. He was slightly older than me, so he was going through his hip-hop phase. Because of his chirpy nature, he made me believe hip-hop was more of a sport than anything else. I saw no harm in the violent lyrics at all. At the same time, I met Eugene Bewe, aka Cynic Troll 606. Cynic was a child of the Wu-Tang, and he also made freestyle tapes with his brother who used to beatbox. They would make tapes and we would sit around and listen to them. I started to learn the words of their records. The craziest thing is all that I was listening to was one guy beatboxing and another rapping. That was when I decided I wanted to rap. I must have been 14 years old. I was around Gavin more than I was with Cynic, and so I picked up the lighter side of hip-hop. It was this tool that I used to defeat my first opponent, Cynic. We never actually had a battle, but I could tell when we rapped together that I had gotten better than him. I had beaten my master. Where to next? If you have been paying attention, you can look back and see the trail of bodies I have left in my journey. For me, rap is similar to a martial art. You can only truly find your potential when you defeat your master. Does this ideology make me a villain? I can't tell. Because of its rebellious nature, my obsession with hip-hop rubbed him the wrong way. He must have not been impressed, particularly by the fact that I was learning these things he was supposed to teach me from songs. This is why parents need to look really close to understand their children. Because of his obsession with making powerful friends, he forgot to look close enough to see that all he had to do was discover hip-hop with me. That's what kind of parent I aspire to be. I want to be the kind that goes through things with their kids. I shudder to think how horrible the music shall be by then, but maybe that would be what it would take to make it bearable. I would love to take my child on whatever adventures his mind creates. Why must he be kept from the world? I shall be around to make sure he doesn't venture into real danger and it shall work because I shall know him enough to help. Not looking close enough at their children is a mistake many parents have made in the last 50 years. I can understand how parents are convinced they have been the best parent they can be. I can see how they can be so disconnected from their child that they think they're actually helping them by stifling him or her. It's a slippery slope. In African culture, it is abomination to speak to your father as a peer. I think this is bullshit. Why should a parent assume the position of professional when at any given point in time he is experiencing his life for the first time? Why would that be the person to assume such a pedestal that you cannot remind them that just like you, they are also going through certain things for the first time? Logically speaking, why would you take a formula that has only been tried from one perspective and apply it to a word that is nothing if short of random? I'm not saying I deserve to disrespect the person that gave me life. I'm just saying there are some situations that parents may not have adequate information on to make a sound decision. My father could have learned a lot about himself from me. I was a mirror of him. I would have been the perfect candidate to use to rediscover himself. This is the type of parent I want to be to my child. African parents especially have this belief that if you are not stern on your children, then you are not teaching them anything. I want to break this theory. I want to be the best father that has ever lived. Every day people tell me I would fail and fall into their ways, but I'm pretty sure I can make it happen. I tried this very method with my youngest brother, and I'm pretty sure it has worked out well. I tried your method. I was there. I reached out many times, and now we are here. My father is dead, and I'm finally healing. Twelve years later. Love yours.
The art is tick. It's an honor to be here, my brother. My brother. Turn me up in the headphones a little bit. You know, there's an old saying. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Well, we done doing nothing. May the light forever shine on everyone that glow before me We used to be just dope, now this whiskey soaked in glory uh, They made us Harley Quinns, we opened up for jokers Throw this league from the shadows, now they kneel when they approach us Even before you sit, these suckers who the throne you son One, two, three, four Hell in the morning, I know you'll be there, it's coming my way Wake up, wake up, breakfast. Please, please turn up the volume on your receiver as high as it can go. Hey guys, my name is Beans. Hey guys, my name is Coffee. And I think Impua was never meant to be food. There, I said it. Okay, if it wanted to be food, why would it taste like that? Fee, and I think that no sleep culture is overrated. Why in heaven's name would you not want to get your eight hours of sleep in order to perform at half your best? It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. Get your eight hours of sleep so that you can be the best every single day. Join Coffee and Beans Sundays on the Avocado Media Network.